Welcome to Saturday. It's another true crime discernment. We are your hosts. I'm Colleen and I'm here with Pastor Sean Carter. Sean, how are you doing today? Doing great. Doing great. Just glad to be here with you talking about this tonight for true discernment. True discernment. This is our third installment. How do you think it's going so far? It's going. It's hard to prepare. It's hard to prepare for some of this stuff and and look at this stuff. And so I'm excited though. I'm excited for tonight's show. Excited to see what we we get into. We got a special kind of a special guest here tonight. So yeah, we do. It's going to be so good. So we wanted to take this opportunity to introduce our listeners to a labor of love of Through the Black called RealDarkNews.com. And our very own producer, Katie and Vicki Joy and um, James Fire from chat and others have been contributing now for a couple of years. Katie, would you like to join us? There well, you are. You? <laughs> yeah. Katie's going to give um, her own little tour to you all today. Katie, welcome to the show. Show us real dark news. Tell our listeners what can be found on the website, because it's more than just a few news articles. There's there's a lot of content here. Yeah, there's actually over 2,500 articles that have been curated over the last couple of years. So thank you for the opportunity. And um, really what we created is something that Tom kind of had the vision of wanting to create something that was related to the Shatter the Darkness work, which of course we've all become familiar with and been trained through, but had kind of the InfoWars feel where you have a database where you can come here and you can run a search. Hey, there was a killing that happened, you know, say six months ago in this state. Okay, well, you can come up here and click the search icon and search for the state and the approximate date. And we may have it archived. Um, we've actually done a lot of cases concerning child abuse. So fair warning, there are triggering articles on this website. So proceed with caution. Generally, the worst of them are noted with editor's notes so that you know before you get too far into it. But to balance all of the dark, we do have a lot of information on spiritual warfare, on faith building exercises. Colleen, you've started putting up prayers, which is something that we desperately needed here. And there's actually Bible studies in here. So it's not just all dark. There is stuff that you can come here and find resources um, one of the main ones is Vicky's articles that she's been posting every month that are the calendars for ritual dates where you can know when to pray and even listen to Russ Dizdar's podcast on prayer mapping. So know how to pray. Excellent. So I've always been a do the do person, you know, that from Thursdays with Reclamation Project. So I appreciate a news story that has a do um, component or a news website that has a do component. And that's why Sean and I are even doing this true crime discernment, because there is a responsibility to the body of believers um, for how the world is going and um, the spirit behind things. So Katie, I really appreciate your hours and hours and hours of work and writing and research and um, just the effort that you've put into Real Dark News. I feel like um, this is kind of a hidden gem. We, we mention it now and then, but I'm not sure people really know about Real Dark News, can it be followed like a blog or how do people get notification of Real Dark News articles as they go up? It can be followed like a blog. It is actually a WordPress website. So there is that component to it. Um, all, the articles that are posted are also automatically posted to Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we're pretty much present on most of the alternative social medias as well. So Gab, MeWe, Parler, uh, and clout hub at this point so any of those locations are places where you can follow real dark news and you can see the articles that are posted by anybody who's publishing on the website do you have a um, need for other contributors and if so what would those needs be we are always seeking people who are willing to contribute to real dark news whether it's a one-time thing or a reoccurring aspect it's entirely up to the individual but Basically, what we're looking for is somebody who wants to provide content from the biblical foundation. So if you know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and the only way for salvation, then if you want to write, we want to hear from you. All right. So how can they get in touch with you? Because I'm assuming it's you that would receive those 
applications? Editor at realdarknews.com. All right. Thank you, Katie. You may go back to producing our show. I appreciate your time and your voice on our show today. Thank you. All right. So as you guys see, we are going to spend some time looking through some Real Dark News um, articles today. Sean and I have cho each chosen a case or two um, from articles that are found on Real Dark News. And we're going to develop those um, crime cases for you. And um, I guess, Sean, that's all I really had to say as introduction. So why don't you show us what cases you've chosen and why and what you'd like to discuss? Well, first of all, I want to say I kind of feel like a big dweeb because I've told Katie like now for like ever that I would kind of start writing on a regular basis. And I was actually writing for our local newspaper here up until last year. And, and so I, I could probably give some content and, and I just feel like a big heel <laughs> for, not, for not getting that uh, in gear quick enough. So hopefully within the next little bit, I'll. I'm not going to make no promises. Don't make okay. promises. But, yeah, because <laughs> I've, I've been broken. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, I, I, looking at one of the things I try to do with Real Dark News is when I start seeing something or I'm researching, that's one of the very first places I actually go to to see if we've had, you know, if Real Dark News has some articles on it and the way it looks and, and kind of do a search and one of the things, like, I'm going to be talking about Ethan Crumbly, and if you go to, like, Real Dark News, and you put in the search, like, the name, uh, yeah, there we go, and you can come up with Ethan Crumbly there, and, and you can kind of, like, scroll up, and I'm actually going to, to read that article there. Um, I can't remember the name of it. I have to put my glasses on so I can see it. <laughs> Just about as bad as Tom with my need from glasses. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're going to talk about, about Ethan today, and we're going to go to some of those articles here in just a moment. But uh, to look at this discerning, one of the reasons why we do this show is to help you, the listener, and as a Christian, to look beyond the darkness in the news, to, to, to go into that content looking for what's going on behind the scenes, so to speak. And I know we can't get a lot of that from media. We can't, even from these news articles and stuff, we really can't get it all. But I believe God begins to show us things as we read, as we research. And so the Oxford High School Shootings by Ethan Crumbly, uh, and I don't know if I'm actually saying his name right or not, but I'm going to give, I'm just kind of just read this as a, uh, kind of the, the stats on it is on November 30th, which is kind of a unique um, time frame in dating. I know that a lot of people, they kind of like we said with um, the real dark news on the calendar with Vicki Joy, uh, but a lot of times, a lot of these calendars don't have all the rituals and stuff on it. And November 18th through but December 2nd is actually probably one of the more used occult holidays that goes unknown, relatively unknown into a lot of spiritual warfare community. But the occult community knows it a lot for Hecate. And you know, the 15th actually is one of Hecate's largest rituals. The reason I'm stating that is because November 30th is kind of the the culmination uh, of that time period. Now, Ethan doesn't write anything about Hecate explicitly that I can find, but I kind of see some similarities, and we may go through that as we go through this. But I, I note the date, November the 30th, a mass shooting occurred at Oxford High School in Detroit, a suburb of Oxford Township, Michigan. A 15-year-old, 15 years old, wow, 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly, armed with a 9mm semi-automatic handgun, murdered four students and injured seven people, including a teacher. Authorities arrested and charged Crumbly as an adult for 24 crimes, including murder and terrorism. Crumbly pleaded guilty 
to all charges in October 22nd, 2022. I'm sorry, 2022. Crumbly's parents, and I, I want to read this too because it's important because this is going to kind of go to where I'm going today. Crumbly's parents, Jennifer and James Crumbly, were charged on December 3rd with involuntary manslaughter for failing to secure a handgun used in the shooting. After failing to appear for an arraignment, the parents were subjects of a manhunt by the U.S. Marshals. They were caught and arrested in Detroit on December 4th. Lawsuits were filed against the school district, Oxford Community Schools, starting or stating uh, and alleging the negligence by school officials towards warning signs exhibited by Kremlin leaning up to the shooting. So here we have a 15-year-old kid, basically, a, a teenager, almost, um, you know, what I would almost consider a preteen in a way, um, taking a handgun. If you read into these accounts, and again, you can research some of this by the Real Dark News, if you read some of those accounts, you realize that he was already in the counselor's office. His parents were in the counselor's office. And I'm a little fuzzy on some of these details, but he had the gun with him. He had his uh, manifesto with him. He had, uh, and there had been rumors with, I think, a week to two weeks out that something was going to happen in this, in this school by him. And, and that was kind of the rumors going out there. He walks into the bathroom, he goes to the bathroom, he, he loads up everything, and he just comes out and he starts shooting. Now, the reason I'm going over this and thinking about this is because there's several things that we get. And one of the very first things I kind of want to talk about is there it talks about the negligence of the school officials and the parents. And there was some issues going on, and, and it talks about how that they should have recognized these red flags. So as just as a moment, um, Colleen, I'm going to ask you a question, and, that, and, and I knew I, I didn't talk, talk to you about this beforehand, mm -hmm. but what are some of your signs or in your thoughts, what are your thoughts about somebody's about to commit a crime like this? How would you what would be warning signs that you would look at? Yeah, you know, this is such a controversial topic because parental responsibility when kids have kind of, you know, gone off the deep end um, can, can really go either way because there are, you know, some parents that are good parents that are providing a stable and safe home environment. And then they have their kids doing things out of rebellion um, and hidden intentionally from the parents. And so I can't just across the board say it's the parents' fault. They should have known better. Um, but I do think that there are some signs that, um, like we've talked about this. We talked about this during the school shootings. We talked about this during Dahmer. But um, parents not knowing their children and, and having the kind of relationship with their child to know what they're struggling with, to know what they feel threatened by, to know what they're... Um, in what they're motivated by, that starts way before 15. And so if the environment of Ethan's home was such that he felt isolated or ostracized by his family or his parents specifically in this, um, that that could be a warning sign. And I, I don't know, you know, I don't know who all he came into contact with at the school. Um, I don't know if it was a school counselor that he was talking to, but I know that school counselors are not emotional counselors, they're mm -hmm. educational counselors. So their, their whole job is to help you plot what courses you're going to take to get into the college you want to have the career trajectory that you want, mm -hmm. not my mom and dad don't love me kind of people. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel bad for a, you know, a person employed by a school district that has the term counselor assigned to their, to their job title, um, because I think that's misunderstood. But I don't, I don't know what teachers was he in classes with? Were there any teachers that knew him? How big are the classes? These are all questions um, that mm -hmm. I think are worth asking. And 
in answering. I, I do think the education system is extremely broken and it's not just because of the content of the education, but the relationship with children. It's very, very easy for parents to assume the school is gonna take care of their children all day. And it's very easy for the educators to think, well, it's not my job to raise your children, it's my job to teach your children. So there is definitely a huge gap, mm -hmm. in my opinion, in our culture when it comes to raising children. Yeah, and I was thinking also about red flags of or warning signs that somebody's about to to commit a murder. I mean, that, you know, how can you do that? I mean, realistically, I mean, how do you know when someone is about to flip or someone's about to be triggered? Or, you know, I've been in situations to where I've I've personally went to a home to. Uh, I was called to come to the home because they were having uh, issues with the son. I get there and uh, I'm sitting in the chair and, and I'm talking with mom and dad and, and he's been listening to the radio. He comes in, he sees me there. Uh, he's like, Hey, what are you doing here? Cause I was his youth pastor. And I was like, Hey, just kind of come and talk to your mom and dad. How are you doing? You know, sit, come sit down. He goes back into his room and he comes out with a shotgun and he puts it right through my head. Mm. And he's like, I know why you're here. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, you know why I'm here. We're, we're going to deal with this situation. And finally, you know, having a shotgun pulled on you is, you know, he was comfortable. Cool. Yeah. He was, you know, how there was no warning signs at that, at that moment for me. Mm -hmm. But I, I found it interesting that they're having a lawsuit for the, and I get this in a way, I get it, mm -hmm. but also how can you predict a human sin nature? What, what are they going to do? In the no. next week? Yeah. And I, you know, Sean also, um, it, it requires discernment because every personality is different. Some children are expressive mm -hmm. and outward when they're upset. Some take it very much inside and they plot internally. Um, how can you know? Cause everyone's different and statistics are just statistics. There wow. are, um, there are plenty of statistics out there about, you know, kids who commit this kind of crime, but then there are those who don't fall within those statistics. Mm. Sean, I don't think that you can predict it using facts and figures and AI. I think it has to be a, a spiritually discerned situation. Well, I, I got to thinking about this. I'm not going to belabor the point much more, but if Katie wants to put on the, the red flag warning, this was very interesting, and I'm not I'm not going to read everything on this page, but I am going to read through. This is red flags, warning signs, and indicators. Following are some warning signs and indicators associated with school shootings in the United States. I want you to listen to this list and give me just a quick reaction at the end of this. I, I think it's kind of in a way funny, a way sad, and a, and just outright ludicrous in a way. Okay. Here's some of the signs. Violent fantasy content. Did we say this way back when about playing games? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Writings, drawings, and, and reading. And I'm going to come back to that one a little bit after a while. Anger problems. Okay. Fascination with weapons. And, and I like this one, especially those designed most often used to kill people. Like semi-automatic, snub nose revolvers, stilettos, bayonets, daggers, brass knuckles. And, you know, I'm not trying to laugh here, but I'm just sitting here thinking, OK, I know several people who they're not going to out here going to kill people, but they, they've got a weapon on them. I, I'm armed right now. I mean, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm fascinated with it. But yeah. anyway, boasting and practicing of fighting. And, and I, I think this one hits me quite hard. Military sh sharpshooter training, martial arts, knife fighting. You know, okay, a loner, suicidal, and then you know, uh, homicidal intentions, um, stalking, non compliance, disciplinary, you know, disciplinary problems, imitation of other murders, interest in previous shootings and situations. And by the way, if you're looking at true crime, is that a you know, if you watch true crime shows, hey, is that an indicator that you're going to go out here? Victim, martyr, self-concept, strange, uh, strangeness, and aberrant, strangeness, and aberrant 
behavior, paranoia, violence, cruelty, inappropriate affect, acting out, police contact, mental health history, expressions, uh, unusual interest in police and military, terrorist activities and materials, use of drugs and alcohol. What did they not put in here? Well, I'm looking at this list thinking, I know that describes the majority of our military prior to them being in the military, yeah. right? It right. describes uh, entire personality types. Um, so I don't think that we can across the board mm -hmm. say that those things mm -hmm. are all a warning sign. But And also there are people who have committed murder who do not fall in to those categories. We, we see housewives, you know, the, the PTA president and the, you know, who have gone off the deep end and killed all their children. And, you know, it's... Um, I think anytime we're building statistics and we're trying to build some sort of fence that is not a biblical fence that has not been set up yeah. by God, we are excluding and the, the, the wrong things and we are including the wrong things. And um, it, it's a false sense of security we're building for ourselves. So yeah, what's the answer, Sean? How do we, how do we rightly discern using that well, word discern? I, I think first of all, prayer in, and I, I kind of coming back to the situation I described earlier, before I went, my wife stopped me and she says, you need to be careful today. She says, let's pray. And so we pray. Mm -hmm. And I can remember coming home and thinking to myself, what did, you know, what just happened? You know, and uh, I think, you know, and I tell people all the time, the Holy Spirit will speak to you in letting you know that something's going on in prayer, you know, as much as the, the society tells us prayer is not effective, it is effective. Mm -hmm. Communicating to our God is the most important thing. Hearing from him, listening to him, talking with him. And that's so crucial. Um, and that kind of reminds me of something. It kind of will lead us into the second my my second and final point with this particular situation um communication in a lot of these shootings and we talked about it with Dahmer we've talked about it with the school shootings there seems to be this communication issue a, communi a lack of communication with the god creator savior friend Holy Spirit, a lack of that communication, and also a lot of communication with evil. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and so with that in mind, we see an article in from Real Dark News, uh, accused school, school shooter texted about demons and developed an interest in Nazi, um, par you know, Nazi stuff. And according to the prosecution, Ethan began texting his mother in March 2021, expressing concern that there was a demon or ghost or someone in the home. Sometimes those texts went unanswered for hours. Two months later, in May 2021, Ethan alleged, allegedly filmed himself torturing animals so let me stop first there and kind of talk about this. And you can kind of keep the article up there for just a second. We can see a, a progression that's starting to take place. He's, if I was the parent and I'm hearing my daughter or son saying there's a ghost or there's a spirit somewhere in our home, I would be more inquisitive instead of letting that go on for hours. I would be responding back. You know, mm -hmm. Let's pray about this. Let's talk about this. Let's. I, I want to engage my son or daughter in that conversation. Yeah. And then we can see that that in May this thing has progressed now to he's torturing animals and have said to keep a bird's head in a jar in his room for six months, without giving a specific time for development. The prosecution alleged that Ethan was also fascinated by Nazi propaganda. 
And then it goes on and we have this idea that uh, it talks about images of guns and stuff like that. And obviously we see that. But there at the end of the article, it's or near the end of the bottom of the page there, defense attorney Merrill Lemons asserted that current police were completely unaware that their sons was allegedly torturing animals or that he kept a bird's head under his bed. Um well, I think I, I think I'd like to change my answer, your officer. <laughs> now I have more information about the parenting. Um, it's not that the information wasn't there to be seen; it was that they didn't want to see it. Yeah, I think something. I think something was going on here spiritually in this household. Yeah. Um, and it was going beyond. Again, we see this torture of animals. We talked about that with with Dahmer. I, I tend to think, and obviously I know that there's a spiritual, dark spiritual presence in that home that, and my point with this is influencing that person. Mm -hmm. So if you have, if you're, if you're listening to somebody out there and they're talking about voices, hearing voices in their home or, or they're, they're, they're dealing with some of this folks, that's not something just to, to sweep underneath the rug. That's probably the start of something that's happening or at least an outer manifestation of something that's already been taking place. I think it's so important to pay attention. One of the reasons why I came and started unveiling the paranormal in reaching out to people in ghost hunting, because there's so many people experiencing the spiritual stuff in their home. And if they don't deal with it, Colleen, if they don't deal with it, it's going to progressively get worse mm -hmm. and it's going to lead them down a road of darkness. Yep. Yep. And so with that in mind, and I'm going to keep that same thing. Um, not, not going to switch here on you, Colleen, but I want to talk about mm -hmm. something that happened to one of my close friends and his wife here recently. Um, okay. One of my close friends, um, I trained him in ministry. He's actually moved from our part of the state into Chesapeake, Virginia. And uh, he called me that he called me one night the other day and he says, dude, my wife just had an, you know, just had an experience, man. There's a shooting at the Walmart. And, you know, Katie can go ahead and put this on the screen. And um, and this this Walmart shooter uh and it claims, and the reason I bring this up is because I want you to hear something. Um, on Friday, the city of Chesapeake tweeted uh, out an image of a death note said to have been recovered from this man's phone. And what it says is, and I want to read this real quick. He says, sorry, God, I failed you. Now, I want you to notice that this is playing right into this, what we see with Ethan, okay? He says, God, I'm sorry I failed you. I felt like, uh, let's see, I failed to listen to the Holy Spirit's groan, which made me a poor representation of you. So we see that there's probably some type of Christian veneer in this guy's home but listen he goes on and says i was harassed by idiots with low intelligence and lack of wisdom i remained strong through the most of the torment but my dignity was completely taken away beyond repair by my phone getting hacked so there's some kind of torture torment going on in that workplace and it goes on and on and on but down there at the bottom he wrote this I hope that people will learn from everyone's mistake and they truly and truly love God and not the material possessions of this world. Now, I want us to remember something. He probably wrote that before he did the shooting. OK, but my point is, what's his view of God's love in loving others? You see, just because there's a Christian veneer, just because there's this belief that's taken or, or talk of God in the home or in the workplace or in the person's life does not mean that everything is okay. And we have to be very careful. And I believe this is one of the reasons why we need true discipleship, true mm -hmm. understanding of what it means to be a Christian, a true understanding of what 
love of God means perfect love. What do you think, Colleen? A hundred percent. I could not agree with you more. Um, I, I was watching a, a guy that I watch sometimes on YouTube talking about true crime, and it was uh, similar in, well, okay, so he's secular, and he's making fun of this person who sort of inspired the crime, right? And the mm -hmm. person who inspired the crime was a conspiracy-minded uh, podcaster with a biblical slant, right? So I, I was listening, thinking this could be Sean and I, this could be yeah. Tom and Vicki Joy, right? That that somebody's taking some sort of twisted um, mm, end of the world thought process or whatever and, mm -hmm. and going out. Um, and there was a ridicule of the biblical stuff, but as as this secular person was, uh, was developing the story and was um, unfolding what really happened, I could hear um, the clips that he had chosen to play of her, the, the podcaster, there was a, like you said, a religious veneer or a biblical perspective, but the undercurrent of it, the spirit underneath it all was um, full of pride, full of sarcasm, full of um, kind of annoyance and impatience. And like, the more you listen to her, the more you could hear she's saying churchy things or even mm -hmm. quoting scripture but the spirit behind what she was saying and doing was a demonic, destructive, um, lustful, evil thing that was coming through her, her presentation. And so you're yeah. correct that there is a biblical truth that does have a counterfeit. And that's why I started the Reclamation Project in the first place, because everything God did and everything he does that's pure and good and, and um, righteous there is a perversion version of that. Um, and we need to be able to discern. We need to be able to understand the character of God through his word in total, not in part, but the whole book together, working together to develop the truth of who he is, what his character is, what his standard is, and what his definition of love and his definition of righteous and his definition of justice. And when we get part of it, but not all of it, we get a perversion. Absolutely. And kind of just wrapping this up and I've only got one more thing and I will be glad to hear what you what you've got planned for tonight. This this guy and Ethan both, I believe, were listening to demonic entities. And we've we've heard this over and over the last few weeks as we've been doing these shows. There's a communication process. Now, as I said a while ago, a lack of communication with God, lack of communication with with the King of King and the Lord of Lords. Mm -hmm. And then a whole lot of communication with dark entities. And here's, I want to kind of cut to the point when we are as Christians, when we talked about this and I've already shared it already, when we're in the break room, when we're in, in the grocery store or wherever we have these conversations and we're hearing people talk and they're talking about, hearing voices or they're they're you know sometimes people come to us for counseling or you know whatever but first of all we got to take it seriously we can't shove it underneath the carpet or assume that they have a mental problem or assume anything first and foremost we need to discern the gravity of this situation mm -hmm. and take advantage not advantage but take this as a as an opportunity to deal with what's being said there's been times where I've interjected and I've stopped into the conversation and say, wait a minute, did you just tell me that you've heard a voice? Mm. Explain that a little bit more to me. Talk yeah. to me a little bit about more about that and gain the information. And the reason I share this is because what people are experiencing and what they're hearing is coming from the dark side. It's communication with evil spirits. Mm -hmm. And there's some people who are engaging in that conversation, there, there, you know, I, there was a guy down here in Saul, I think it was Salisbury, North Carolina. One of the most famous cases uh, of this it was kind of around the time of uh, the Manson thing and all that, um, where the, he heard his dog say, "Anybody with red eyes, go out and kill them," and he started going out and shooting people mm -hmm. down here in the middle of the road. And it's because people 
or listening to these dark spirits, the first thing I want to share with you folks here tonight, if you're hearing those spirits, stop communicating with them. Stop listening. Stop letting them talk to you. I've, I've talked to people before and, and they say, well, I tell them to stop. And, 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 and they like they start engaging. Why are you talking to me? Why don't mm -hmm. even go there. Tell them to stop and don't give them the time of day. In the name of Jesus, leave. Get out. Stop. You can't talk to me no more. Be very adamant and don't let them even tell you anything. Every time you hear that, that voice, begin to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Don't give it the time of day. Yep. I, I'm shocked at how many people will have a conversation with something in their home. Me, I don't have that conversation. I've, right. had, I've had spirits say, are you home? I'm like, in the name of Jesus, I don't even answer yeah. them. I don't need, I don't need to know where you came from or why you're here. I, yeah. I'm, oh. I, I'm not under your command. I'm not listening. Yeah. yeah and, and that's, that's something that, that's truly shocking to me of, of how, and then there's there that's kind of one level, and then there's the next level to where I've seen and I've I've worked with people who have spirit animals coming and talking to them, mm -hmm. and they've under the influence of drugs, or they they had they took mushrooms, and mushrooms will mess you up, man, and and that gives them a gateway. And mm -hmm. as I was counseling this guy, I've said this before, I've told him that you know you have to understand what this animal is telling you, what this spirit God is telling you is, is against the word of God. It's not life giving. It, it's, it's yeah. taking you down a road. And finally the God realizes what I was talking about, but I share this because it is a constant fight. Some people will say, well, they don't stop. No, they're not going to stop. You have to have God to send them away. You have to rebuke them. You can't get involved. You can't answer their questions. You can't, it, you know, get them gone. What do you think? Colin? You don't have to, de you don't even have to defend yourself. Scripture says that he will be my defender. I don't have right. to defend myself. I don't have to give an answer to them. Like I have one judge and I'm not standing in his, in his throne room <laughs> at my judgment yet. Right. right. So yeah, I agree. I 100% agree. I also think it's interesting too, you know, um, somebody's listening to their dog talk to them. Um, there's something about not talking about the spirit realm that gi does give the spirit realm power because mm -hmm. if my if I didn't know about the demonic, if I didn't understand that there is a power out there that is not righteous, if I didn't believe that, because my culture has dumbed it down or, oh, that's mm -hmm. ridiculous or, oh, you're crazy. When it does happen, I'm much more likely to listen to it. Right. So, yeah. um, so having the awareness that a demon could operate through your dog or, you know, that there could be some sort of paranormal thing that happens and it's not something to be inquisitive about. It's something to shut down. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, that there's power in not in that understanding and knowledge that, um, that yeah, that stuff can happen. It does happen, and all the other cultures in the world acknowledge it, except ours. So, like, we yeah. need to get on board and start recognizing that there is a power, there is signs and wonders that do come from the dark side, and um, that are greater than what science can explain. So, that needs to be that word needs to be gotten out there too, because if it happens, you need to understand. Yeah, of course this can happen. What are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. You going to obey? Like that's ridiculous. So. Yeah. And that, that's, you know, kind of just to wrap that up. I mean, I've, I've seen, I've seen people, they've heard things throughout their life and these voices can also be, and I'm not trying to get psycho analyst or anything here or, or get into the youngin and stuff, but I have seen where people have heard things from TV, from music. In fact, I think if you go back and look at some of these articles, I forgot which one it was, I think it was the guy from Walmart. Uh, he was again using music and he was using that music and he was writing music to filter out his feelings and those beliefs were coming out and was in, in that engagement of the spirits to help you write. And I don't know how many people I've heard in the music industry mm -hmm. communication. And I said all that to say this, 
communication in any form, whether you might not be talking to them, but you may be listening to them. They right. may be giving you lyrics. That's not a good thing. Okay. No. No. <laughs> you know, it is you're they're feeding you a belief system. And if you allow it, if you if you absorb that into your system, guess what? That's where it changes you. Yeah. That aggression goes. So that's it for me, Colleen. Interesting to hear what you have to say tonight. Well, Sean, my case, you're going to have to stick with me. There's a lot of information I'm going to be kind of throwing at you about one case. I just chose one. Um, let me just read to you a little bit here, and then I'll have Katie show some different articles as we get there. So, Sean, in 2012, David Lee Hamlin, who was then 58, was charged with 18 counts of sexual abuse of a child in the late 80s and throughout the 90s. So he was charged in 2012 in Provo, Utah, um, for crimes that were committed in the 80s and 90s, late 80s and, and throughout the whole 90s. These charges were ultimately dismissed without prejudice, which gives prosecutors the option to refile charges later. So there's not a lot of information. Katie, can you show the 2012 article that I shared with you earlier? It's not a real dark news article, but I went back and found there's, there's that creep. This is written in 2012, and this basically is just a little blurb. You can kind of go down and show how short it really is. There's there's not a lot of information. He was charged, and then they chose not to prosecute and left the option to prosecute later. Okay. However, in the last 10 years, there has been no move to recharge or prosecute David Lee Hamlin until, as Real Dark News reports, the end of May this year. So, Katie, I don't know if you want to show both articles that you've posted on Real Dark News about this case, you're welcome to do that search and put that up. Okay, and we're going to look at the other one that says the county attorney calls for the sheriff to resign, which is the, the first one that was posted. There you go. And I'm going to read that article to you. I know it's small on the screen, but here's what it says. It says, Utah County, Utah, on May 31st, 2022, the Utah County Sheriff's Office issued a press release concerning an investigation that had been active and ongoing since April of 2021 into the claims of, quote, ritualistic child abuse and child sex trafficking, end quote. The ensuing investigation discovered that other victims had previously reported similar forms of ritualistic se sexual abuse and trafficking and that portions of these allegations were confirmed. According to the release, release of the Sheriff's Department, which serves 600,000 citizens and covers over 2,000 square miles, according to their Twitter. So this uh, release that the Sheriff's Department disclosed that the investigation is centered around allegations that took place between 1990 and 2010 in Utah, and then Joab and San, San Pete counties. Um, this office of the sheriff, the special special victims unit um, person that they're quoting says, we are pleased with the public and encourage victims or individuals with knowledge of these crimes to contact the Utah County Sheriff's Office Special Victims Unit so that they can be offered the assistance possible. We understand that there are individuals who have concerns for their safety and, our, and well-being who have been silenced, but we need your help. At this time, the sheriff's department has declined to name any individuals involved in the investigation, stating in a press briefing, we believe that there has been ritualistic child sexual abuse that has happened. And he said, we're being just as careful as we can before we toss names out. They would not state whether they are looking into fewer or more than 10 individuals. Adam Herberts, a reporter for Utah Fox 13, took to Twitter following the announcement saying, quote, I've been investigating the case for months. I can confirm some subjects of the investigation are high profile individuals, end quote. At this time, the sheriff's department has declined to name any individuals involved in the investigation, stating in a press briefing, quote, we believe there has been ritualistic child sexual abuse that has happened. And he said, quote, we are being just as careful as we can before we toss names out. They would not state whether, oh, I already put that part. They would not state whether they were um, looking into fewer or more than 10 individuals. Um, okay, so Adam Herberts, this guy took to Twitter and said that he's been investigating it. He's a reporter. He also spoke with a survivor identified as Brett Bluth, who told of his experience with a previously accused therapist 
Blue said, um, hip hypnosis was a big part of it. He told me from the very beginning, Blue said, um, that that was his main technique. He stated that he met this person through a therapist through a referral program of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for treatment of homosexuality. That therapist was never convicted as a case against him was dismissed despite police reportedly having a taped confession of at least one sexual assault. County attorney David Levitt also spoke with Herberts, announcing that he that he, quote, has not engaged in ritualistic sexual abuse or cannibalism, end quote, despite not being named, despite not being named as a suspect in the investigation. So this county attorney is defending himself, saying that he has not been um, involved in cannibalism or sex abuse, but he hadn't been named as a suspect. So that's a little odd, don't you think, Sean? <laughs> would you yeah. would you just make a public statement as a county attorney? I haven't been eating people or abusing yeah. people. Unless you thought maybe you're being looked into. Yeah. Okay. Oh so goodness. Levitt then, the county attorney, claimed that the investigation was a political stunt and called for the sheriff, Mike Smith, to resign. So he hasn't officially been named, but he wants the sheriff to resign because he's concerned, I guess, that he's being investigated. Anyway, both Smith and Levitt are up for re-election this year. So I don't know how that election turned out, at least the primary part in, in no, early November. But um, according to... Another report by Fox 13, Levitt and his wife had been accused by the same individual that initially accused the therapist of wrongdoing. He described the women as the woman as tragically mentally ill and said that the allegations were determined not to be credible. Okay, then um, Katie, in September, Real Dark News posted the, this next article, which you showed that the first arrest was made. So that first article did not name names. It did not name David Hamlin. It, it just showed some quotes um, from the county attorney and the sheriff's department saying, hey, we're investigating this, but hey, nothing to look at with me. I'm fine. You should reelect me. Um, okay, so this this one is one that was posted at the end of September. I believe the 28th it was posted. Um, and this is what it says. Utah County, Utah. Months after news of ritual abuse investigation made national headlines, the first arrest was announced yesterday, which would have been September 28, 2022. The now former therapist at the center of the investigation, who is now 68 years old, David Hamlin, was taken into custody Wednesday morning. He is currently in custody at the Utah County Jail. At this time, the charges against Hamlin include three counts of sodomy on a child, rape of a child, two counts of aggravated sexual abuse of a child, and lewdness involving a child. According to records obtained by Fox 13, Hamlin was secretly recorded confessing to sexual abuse of a female family member during a phone call. He said, quote, I'm sorry for raping you. I'm not saying it was true. I'm not saying somebody in my body didn't do it, end quote. Charges previously filed against Hamlin in 2012 were dropped by the Utah County Attorney's Office in 2014, citing difficulty obtaining medical records and other corroborating evidence. Brett Bluth, who spoke with the news station at the time of the investigation was first announced at the end of May, expressing optimism about Hamlin's arrest. Brett said, quote, I do think it will be different this time, end quote. Brett previously had said that hypnosis was a big part of his treatment, his being um, David Hamlin's therapy treatment, and explained that Hamlin had told him that's his main technique. Brett continues to say, quote, he had a yellow notepad with line papers of notes and he would read them back to me saying, this is what one of your personalities said while you were under hypnosis, Brett recalled. I told him I was never under, but I went home from those ses sessions thinking I had hurt other people. So this therapist is hypnotizing the then child, Brett, um, and then telling him what he had said under hypnosis and basically accusing him of having hurt people. Well, Brett is claiming that he never actually went under hypnosis, but still left feeling kind of grimy. Um, in 2000, Hamlin surrendered his license after admitting that he had, quote, had intimate relationships with several patients during clinical therapy sessions and had claimed to some of these patients that the intimacy was therapeutic for them, end quote. Although a no longer licensed therapist since 2000, Hamlin reportedly conducts therapeutic, quote, peyote ceremonies, end quote, through his new church. During 
a protest in Utah City against the ban of peyote in religious ceremonies, Hamlin said, quote, people say it's a hallucinogen, which it's not. It's a plant portal to the spirit world. If you believe in the reality of the spirit world, what you see is real, whether it's negative or positive, end quote. Citing arrest documents filed against Hamlin, a woman told investigators that she was six or seven years old when she was sexually assaulted in Hamlin's basement while he critiqued and criticized her abilities, end quote. The victim described that she felt confusion, and then it goes on. We won't, we won't read all that. Katie, would you show um, that Fox 13 video clip that I sent you? We're going to watch. We we'll have things. a breaking news update to a Fox 13 investigation. The Utah County Sheriff's Office has arrested one of its suspects in a ritualistic child sex abuse investigation. Fox 13 News investigative reporter Adam Herbetz has been following this story all year, and he's live in studio with an update. Yeah, Max, this is David Hamblin. He's a former therapist, and that's his previous mugshot from back when he was charged with 18 counts of sex abuse in 2012. We first found out about this new case from victims in February. That's how long we've been accumulating information on this man. And the first thing we did was look back at that old case, trying to figure out why those charges were dropped by the Utah County Attorney's Office. You can read it right there on your screen. Even though Hamblin confessed to raping one of his young female family members in an undercover phone call recorded by the Provo Police Department, Hamblin was not the only suspect back then, and even though he was arrested this morning, we know he's not the only suspect now. On your screen, in April, we started interviewing victims for the first time on camera. That's Brett Bluth, one of Hamblin's former patients. He says he used to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he was recommended to Dr. Hamblin for conversion therapy. That's something he wanted at the time, but he says those sessions took a turn. Hypnosis was a big part of it. He told me that from the very beginning, that that was his main technique. Doctor would say, do you want to be healed of your homosexuality or not? And the answer was yes. Do you think this time it will be different? I do think it will be different. I think in part because I have some information that can connect some dots. Then in May, the Utah County Sheriff's Office spoke about this case for the first time publicly, announcing it was opening a ritualistic child sex abuse investigation spanning three counties, Utah County, San Pete County, and Juab County between the years 1990 and 2010. They did not name any suspects, but the next day, Utah County Attorney David Levitt held a press conference naming himself and describing his link to Hamblin. This therapist was my elders form president in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was my neighbor. I had a family connection and I testified at that divorce here. I'm well aware of who the therapist is and I'm well aware of many of the players here. Levitt said the investigation was politically motivated, but even after he lost his bid for re-election, the investigation into Hamblin and others continued. And all of that, of course, leads us back to today, this morning, with what the Utah County Sheriff's Office describes as its first arrest. We expect they will have a press conference this afternoon, and we will be live from Utah County with that update when it happens. For now, in studio, Adam Herbetz, Fox 13 News, Utah. Okay, so the person you saw at the end of that clip was the Attorney General Levitt, who is the one who spontaneously said, I'm not guilty of cannibalism or sexually abusing children. Hmm. Seems like he's friends, neighbors, been together in ministry through the church. Okay, I'm gonna go on to, there's another article um, written by KUTV out in Utah that was also dated the same date as the Real Dark News article September 28th of this year, which says, a probable cause statement from the previous case, meaning the 2012 one, detailed horrific allegations involving a girl as young as five, crimes that police said continued over the years in the 1990s. Court records indicate Hamlin's lawyer recently moved to expunge his record, 
and request a request which was opposed by the Attorney General's office. Criminal Deputy Attorney General Craig Barlow filed the objection to this um, to this year to expunge the expungement request saying, quote, Hamlin is currently the subject of an ongoing criminal investigation by four law enforcement agencies into the same conduct that elicited the charges in the 90s, according to Barlow's objection. The Utah County Attorney David Levitt, who we just saw in that video in June, called into question actions by the sheriff's office over its handling of the alleged ritualistic child abuse ring. Levitt said that he and his wife were subjects of child sex abuse investigation a decade ago, allegations that he said were completely false. There is no organized ring of abuse, he said at a June 1st press conference following the UCSO's announcement that it had reopened the investigation. It was debunked more than 10 years ago. It was dismissed by someone who was not in any respect affiliated with me and was not even in, it was not even investigated in a serious way by the Sex Crimes Task Force of Utah County, end quote. He accused the Utah County Sheriff of using the investigation as a political weapon Ahead of an upcoming primary election, Levitt lost his race for another term of office in the Republican Party primary in late June. Okay, so we do see he did, he did not get that in November on the ballot. Sheriff Mike Smith says that the latest investigation delves more into claims that the case in which Levitt said he and his wife were accused. Smith said 20 people have contacted his office with information and now the FBI is involved. This case is still being actively investigated according to the UCSO statement. We will not discuss ongoing details of this case. We will not discuss the names, victims, suspects, or witnesses who may be involved in the case. And also, according to a probable case affidavit obtained by lawandcrime.com, a female victim in April 2022 reported the Utah County Sheriff's Office has been repeatedly sexually assaulted by Hamlin for years, beginning in the, in the mid eighties when she was approximately six or seven. The victim grew up in the same Provo neighborhood where Hamlin resided and told police that she regularly played with Hamlin's children and had been babysat on numerous occasions by David. The victim told police that the first assault she could remember occurred when she and two other children were in the basement of the Hamlin home. And that article goes into a lot more detail than I'm comfortable going into here. Um, however, um, she was abused again a second time when she was seven or eight, noting that it was just prior to her baptism in to presumably the Mormon faith. Um, and again, there's a lot more detail about that. In that detail, she also states there was an, an adult female present. And um, yeah, that's where I want to end with some of that. So Prosecutors have asked for Hamlin to be held without bond due to the allegations that he committed egregious crimes against a child. So, Sean, I know I just threw a lot of information at you, kind of in rapid fire, tried not to go too far into that. Based on what we've seen, we see men and women accusing this <clears throat> therapist or POD circle therapist now, not licensed anymore. Um not only about this current case, but also the case back in 2012. Um, what's your first impressions regarding this case without developing my thoughts at all? Well, I tell you what, one of the things I was thinking about is the use of the word ritual and the use of, of the religion that was involved. You know, obviously we can look to the Mormon faith and see that there's a lot of occult Gnostic beliefs that's inside that church itself. And, you know, we don't really see from the news reports and everything, all the ritualistic stuff that's going on and the beliefs that were probably being in installed into the children. But we do, I think, see a little bit of that belief installed or, or being taken advantage of with this guy dealing one of the things that hit me with that, the, the, the victim, when he said, yeah, you know, I, I want free from this. So the first thing that we, we see is here's a guy who is experiencing these sexual feelings and he knows in, in, inherently that these things are wrong and he's searching for help. And the help he gets is this is so sad that he gets this guy who is hypnotizing and notice how that keeps coming back over and over and over again. 
the hypnotism is there for the programming and for dissociating and, and all those things. One of the things that just really hits me is that the fact that when we talk about the word ritual, it's not just a an actual, you know, ceremony. It's actually the installing of belief and perverting of a belief. So, you know, I kind of, I can go on from there, but it's just. Yeah, that was one of my questions uh, because this is the police, the sheriff's department calling it ritual abuse ring. And so who's defining ritual here? Is it, what are, right. I, I don't know. They weren't very clear how they define ritual. I think you and I have uh, maybe a, different categories of ritual abuse that, you know, we could see, you know, like you said, the religious aspect of it. Um, sometimes ritual abuse is like repeated. It's, it's the ritual. We always do this every time we go do this thing. It's our ritual. Um, sometimes it's within a religious worship service type ceremony. Um, so I'm super curious what the sheriff's department classifies as ritual abuse and in, in this. Um, so we're currently December 1st, very beginning of December. And the latest news article I could find anywhere, I, I, I was looking into this this week. Um, the most recent news article was dated mid-October, and it was basically just an adding to some of the charges. I think he had six initially, and then they added some more charges um, based on, on the allegations from the 80s and 90s crimes. Mm. Um, however, no one else has been implicated or arrested in this case. But and I'm just, go but ahead. Yet they're, but the, yet they're in three counties. Yeah. Yep. Three, and one there's, of the victims is quoted as saying there was an adult female in the room right. and participating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is this an unusual amount of time to just from your understanding of how law enforcement works and, mm -hmm. um, this kind of thing. Is this an unusual amount of time to wait for an accomplice to be re arrested in any case in general? Uh, and if so, what's the holdup? Well, again, I think in my, from my limited experiences, I think what either, either number one, and I know this is kind of one of those duh statements, but either number one, they don't really have a lot of information and they're just waiting to see what they, what they can, you know, what information they, um, Sus not suspects, but victims that they can come up with. Or um, it would be interesting to see if there's uh, some unsealed indictments on another case. Um, mm. They may be waiting for something else to, to fall into place before they... Uh, what I've seen in the past, like, for example, um, there was a um, murder case here not long ago in our community and um, everybody's wondering, well, they, they got the evidence. Why are they not perse persecuting now? Why are they not going forward? And it ended up they had an accomplice, and that accomplice was in the process of being indicted okay. and on, on some other other charges. Other stuff. So they wanted to pull all of that together. And when once all those indictments fell into place, they unsealed them, and that's when it, it fell out. That could be what's happening here, because as I pointed out, there's three different. When you have three counties, you have three different sheriff's offices. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that in itself is going to create. And that's one reason why a lot of these serial killers and killers do it different places, because they know commu communication. They can't talk. Yeah. <laughs> Sucks. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but. To me, it's interesting, like you said, the, the woman and there's multiple victims they're talking about. So it's not just one or two victims. They have other victims. Of what, at least that's what it sounded like to me, right? Yeah, so um, definitely multiple victims. Uh, I think between the four or five different articles I read outside of uh, Real Dark News, I, I had a hard time knowing. I think the only one they actually named was that Brett guy that we showed in the video. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a hard time knowing if I was reading about the same woman in different uh, different occasions, different ages, or different people of different ages. And so um, so, I, I don't know how many I had to count. But So another thing that's going to play involved here is the religious aspect. Um, mm -hmm. 
So, for example, since it's a Mormon church, the, the officers, they're not going to look at the church, whether the, the Mormon church is legit or not. They're, they're not there to right. make the call between Christian no. and non-Christian. They're right. there to persecute. But when a case, and we've, I think me and you've talked about this a couple of times, and maybe me and Tom, uh, I don't know whether on air or not, but there's, there's cases that we've worked, I've worked, that the police will not get involved because they're afraid to touch because of the religious component. Right. Um, and they're very afraid. And the Mormon church has a lot of money. <laughs> so yeah. there may be church officials that's involved in this. And they're probably some of the officers like, if we're going to go forward with this, we, we need that proof. We, before we, we need forward. to be sure that we're sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, I think we're all uncomfortable with the fact that that man was very clearly indicted on 18 charges in 2012. And then for whatever reason, the then prosecutor dropped the charges without pre prejudice, leaving open um, the legal ability to bring those charges back at some point. Why 10 years, giving the best case scenario, giving the benefit of the doubt, let's pretend there's nothing shady going on there. Let's just pretend that for a second. Why would it take 10 years to bring up charges again? Are we waiting for 10 more years of perpetrating? Well, I'm not making excuses by no means. I think there is some nefarious stuff going on there by, by the church. He's a church. And by the way, it sounds like he's acting as a church counselor, isn't it? Isn't he? It's, it's yeah, it sounds like that's, that was Initially, how that Brett guy, the church um, assigned Brett to talk to him yeah. as the counselor. It's not clear what these peyote ceremonies, if that's church sponsored or if that's just out <laughs> on his own after he after he rescinded his license in 2020 mm. or whatever it was, or 2002, whenever it was. Um, no, 2000, whatever. Ten years. So though, he's I doing think, something. Yeah. Ten years to me is either number one, the he fell through the crack cracks, which is very, I mean, probably more than likely what happened. He probably fell through the mm -hmm. cracks. The prosecutors probably, I don't know if that was a regional prosecutor or not, but you know, if he's got so many stuff on his desk, you know, he's probably got people, you know, screaming, you know, do this case, do that case. But mm -hmm. also I think because of, again, coming back to that church connection, the prosecutor was like, yeah, you know, we, I don't want to, you know, this is, he's a counselor. We're we going to persecute the church now. How, how do we proceed? Right. This? Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So you and I are sitting here talking about what they are doing over there. And it's, it can be maddening and it can be impersonal because neither of us live in Utah and none of us have um, young children seeing a church counselor or anything like that. It, we, we can find a way to distance ourselves from that, but we are in the image of God created to have a sense of justice, to advocate for the widow and the orphan and those who are being oppressed and to bring to light the things that are being done in the hidden and in the secret Sean, what is our responsibility with this case and the many, many others like it? Well, I think we provide support, um, spiritually support for, for people who are the victims, but also we as a community and where we're at need to advocate um, and be involved. You know, look at this, be in prayer, but, you know, we're actually looking right now as a church our church is actually starting to look into the foster care program and knowing knowing all the stuff i've watched and you know with through vicky joy and tom and you and and even with sherry and, and some of these other people i've listened to how that how that's broken um man it, it, it's it's where do you start how do you get involved and, you know, something we're talking about here at the church is helping the families individually and, yeah. and getting involved. And uh, so we've we've put out some some situations. But again, think about how the en enemy and I don't know if you were expecting this or not, but think about how the enemy now has used this 
-hmm. People are going to be afraid to go to the church. I mean, think about the Catholic situation. Yeah. And rightfully so afraid to go to the church. Um, so, you know, but for me personally, uh, going out and praying and advocating um, and helping people through their through that process, helping the victims mm -hmm. through the process of sharing what they've experienced and, and being their advocate. This is a another example, yet another example, like with Ida Bell, who I talked about, the church has abdicated our authority, our right and our responsibility to um, the government or these other organizations, you know, fought, you bring up foster care. That's a really good point. I saw a post just earlier this morning online where I don't know who it was. It was a pastor had said he, he got tired of being offended and annoyed at the, the drag queen story hour at the local library. So he did a pastor story hour. It's like, well, I can sit back and complain or I can do something different, give a different option. Right. And um, so I agree, um, you know, being, you know, doing the next right thing for the next family and letting this case, however God wants to work this out, we can pray for justice. We can pray for the hidden things to be brought into the light. We can pray for those that have set snares to fall into their own snare. We can pray the biblical things and we can pray for a protection for those who are prosecuting. We can pray for godly judges or even just judges with a heart for justice, even if they don't know God himself. Um, so we can be advocating for that case as it's ongoing and we can, you know, pray that it continues and that that God's chosen people are the ones that touch it, you know, that hold the files and, and, and press forward. But, but yeah, it'd be, it'd be really great not to keep seeing these kind of cases in the news. And if, if we, the body could step up in some way and um, be a, an option, be a solution, that's a safe solution so that um, these people don't just have a free for all like they've been having. Yeah. I mean, um, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no go ahead. Say, I think that it's important that we as a church, you know, I sat down with our our church body here a few weeks ago and, and kind of poured out what God is wanting us to do, what I feel God's wanting us to do as a leader. And I, I stopped and I said, look, God's not only speaking to me. If, if God is speaking, if God is wanting this church, this fellowship to do something, he's not just going to speak to me. I'm, I'm not the all knowing, all Right. Of this, you guys, you ladies and gentlemen, are going, going to be a part of that. And mm -hmm. I had wrote down things on my paper that I felt like God was wanting us to do. And one of them was foster care. And one of the ladies stepped up and said, Hey, God, I feel like God is leading us to get involved with two foster mm -hmm. families in our community. We need to be their support. We need to not, we mm -hmm. not only need to help those families. But we need to let those children know that we love them, and there's there, there's more people there. And so, Sean, you know, it's interesting you said that because as you were saying, you're not the only one that needs to hear. I got a quick, uh, like, flash of God on Mount Sinai delivering the mm -hmm. law, the Ten Commandments, and um, when He spoke, all of Israel heard, mm -hmm. and they were like, oh, we don't, oh, this is overwhelming. We don't want to deal with this. Moses, you just go listen to what he says and then let us know. And that's like their first error is that they right. they abdicated, they rejected their responsibility and their right to hear from God and said, we'll just follow whatever leader the leader says. So Moses, right. who happened to be righteous and wanting to do God's will, thankfully, um, did had that responsibility on himself and he took it and, and he, you know, wasn't human and he messed up some stuff. But um, what happens if you, we, the body, be like, oh, we don't want to hear from God. That's just too heavy and it's too scary and it's very overwhelming. And and then we give it to somebody who is like this man from the Mormon church yeah. and turn our children over to him thinking, oh, he's hearing from God. It's fine. We, I don't have to. That's terrifying. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's terrifying to see that we don't have Christian men and women in ministry or in even in a secular place, uh, dealing with some of these issues. Um, I know Christian police officers. I know Christian counselors. I know Christian um, lawyers, believe it or not. <laughs> but uh, we need people intervening in our society 
and in our people, uh, people's in our communities' lives. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time for the church to stop. Um, and I'm, when I say church, I'm not talking about just this brick and mortar church that I'm sitting in right now. I'm talking about the body of Christ, whether you're on the Internet, whether you go to a house church, whether you go to a brick and mortar church on Sundays or Saturdays or whenever you go. You have and I have we all have that responsibility to be the hands and feet of Christ and not mm -hmm. say someone else do it. You know, right. we've got to be the one to hold the hands. We've got to be the one to deal with the trauma. Mm -hmm. Yep. And raise the alarm when we see something that's not right. You know, I think back to your Ethan Crumley case um, and, and the little testimony you told of going over to that kid's house and having the shotgun put in your face. Um, understanding discernment about what you are supposed to do is so important because in, in one case, it may be you go to the authorities and tell them something's not right here. And it may be you go and give them a hug because, mm -hmm. you know, only God really knows um, if they love their wickedness or if they're feeling trapped in some sort of like deception or whatever, whatever it may be. So um, the response isn't going to be the same across the board. Again, the enemy work is the one that works in facts and, and figures and stats and um, mm -hmm. formulas. But God, God is living his word is living and active and it's applicable we just have to listen to his spirit to know how to apply and when to apply and what to do about it mm -hmm. sean is there a, a specific verse or section of scriptures um that has kind of been prominent at all and no pressure if there's not but as we've been discussing the real dark news stuff these these cases as a whole or or the idea mm -hmm. of crime and then um like even as an example, based on scripture, God's word, how does our heavenly father view these things and how can we make sure that we're in line in correct perspective, not like you showed in the list, um, incorrect right. fascination, but like having his heart for it and not turning a blind eye to what is happening. Um, well, I think of Psalms 82 it comes to my mind right off the bat is you know Psalms 82 where it talks about you know, God in the midst of the council. I know Mike Kaiser talks about this, but as, as God is, he's actually judging that council. He's actually coming down and says, you know, I gave you, um, I gave you charge to, to be over the weak. I gave you charge mm -hmm. to protect the, the weak, to, to bring righteousness you know, and even in the book of Amos, we see that, you know, he says, let righteousness and judgment flow in uh, this idea that we as Christians uh, need to give ourselves over. You know, when Jesus, Matthew chapter 28 says, you know, there in verses 19 through 21 says, go ye therefore and make disciples. Mm. One of the things people don't get with that is he's not saying have a Bible study once a week and go over this information. Right. He's saying develop a relationship. Right. Walk out life. <laughs> yeah. Do life with these people. You know, yeah. if, if yeah. you're going to, when, when Jesus was talking about going to the prisons and feeding the people, going to the prisons means you went and you sat in the jail cell with them for periods of time. Mm -hmm. You were their companion in the jail. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were going to feed the, you, you brought people in your home, it got personal. It wasn't just, okay, I go to the jail and do my jail ministry and then go home. Or, okay, I took a bottle of water to a person. I'm good now. It, it's, it's giving of yourself and, uh, and developing that relationship. So I know that Katie and the other journalists at Real Dark News are going to keep an eye on this case and others. Um, if you are interested in following and seeing how God, praying for and following and seeing how God chooses to um, work in this case and in the lives of those people, you know, may, maybe he'll allow us to see some of that, um, the fruit of some of our prayer regarding that Um so keep checking back to realdarknews.com over the coming weeks and months um, on those things. But even more so, maybe maybe make, I don't know, if you're doing the prayer mapping, Tom and Vicky, Vicky talked about a few weeks ago, maybe make um, 
a habit in your own heart and mind, when you see these distressing things, it now becomes your prayer assignment. If, if it gets you emotionally, if it gets to you, what is it that God's response, what is the spirit of God in you working both to will and to act according to his purpose through that getting of you? Um, it's really easy to roll our eyes and slam our fists down and walk away in a huff because we're annoyed or frustrated or um, overwhelmed. But there's there's a do when we see things we don't like or when we see things we do like, there's a do. Um, so I just want to encourage our listeners to actually become active. Um, the realdarknews.com website is not the only place that you can find a do to do, but I really do encourage you to peruse that. I know um, James Fire has some blog style articles that get you thinking. I know that, you know, we've already talked about Vicki's calendar. Um, some of my prayers, I've just started putting some prayers up there. there there's some action points there, some Bible study stuff like, like Katie pointed out earlier. I want to really encourage our Through the Black family online that we may or may not have even met in person to really use the resources that we put out there. We should not be an entertainment channel. If you are being entertained by us, check, check your reasons for being here. We aren't doing this for free for all of these hours a week for all of these years so that you're entertained. We're doing this because we want the body of believers, those who who believe the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 to grow up and to act in the way that God has designed us to act. And so um, with all of that said, Sean, would you please bring this week, week six of this season on <laughs> Through the Black to a close in prayer and um, end us out? Yep, sure will. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Life, salvation, grace. And Lord, as we go through these shows and it's dark stuff, there's real dark news. There's all these things going on. And we know that we'll, the only thing that will bring light is you. And Lord, I ask that you would help us as the viewers and as the content providers that we would go out into our world and take your light into those places, that we would talk to the lonely, that we would begin to share the love of uh, you, you have for us with them. And Lord, when, when people are talking about spirits, when they're talking about hearing voices, Lord, help us to have discernment for those times and for those conversations Give us wisdom on those things to say and the things to do. And Lord, if we do need to reach out to maybe family or law enforcement or someone to let somebody know that something's going on, that we that they need help, Lord, help us to be uh, wisdom with that and help us to go forward and protect life. Lord, help us to see the, the things that's going on. Lord, we don't want to see dark things. Yet we need to see those dark things so that we can expose them and correct them. And so, Lord, give us the wisdom, the power, the strength, and the willingness to go forth and to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.